you. We love you. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, we're going to win. We're going to win so big. Thank you very much. Donald Trump promises America a golden future. And we will make America great again. God bless you and good night. I love you. But Trump's new presidency soon meets with heavy attacks. Vladimir Putin is said to have incriminating information about his personal and financial affairs. There are persistent rumors about financial connections with Russia. Fake news, according to Trump. I own nothing in Russia. I have no loans in Russia. I don't have any deals in Russia. Why would Trump so vehemently deny any ties to the Russians? There is Russian money that may have um, sources that are scandalous. So help me God. Congratulations, Mr. President. Yeah! When Zembla investigates Trump's business partners, it comes across the Russian mafia. The threat said, if you don't drop the case now, then you'll regret it. And we end up at Dutch trust offices that are involved in money laundering practices. Zegt u dat iets? Nee, maar ik denk dat het heel veel Ja. Het is wel veel tien jaar geleden. I believe we will have a very good relationship with Russia. I believe that I will have a very good relationship with Putin. Our investigation begins during the American election campaign, where it first becomes clear that there is a special connection between Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin. When I heard that, I thought, well, that's very unusual. That's almost an endorsement. Why would Vladimir Putin be endorsing Donald Trump? In Washington, we meet Malcolm Nance. Over the past 30 years, he has worked for various American intelligence services, including the CIA and the NSA. Nance has written a bestseller on manipulation of the presidential elections. Quotes from Putin and Trump have given rise to his investigation. And as soon as I saw that, I said, okay, we need to go backwards on this story. And I started looking into it. And his first contacts back in 2013 were amazing. His, his statements uh, for the Miss Universe pageant. Only one woman in the world will win and stand out above the rest to become Miss Universe. Welcome back to Miss Universe 2013 coming at you from Moscow. The big man on campus, Donald Trump. In 2013, Donald Trump takes his crown jewel to Moscow. At that point, he is owner of the Miss Universe pageant, which makes him millions. This will be a great one, there's no question, because of the fact that it's Miss Universe in Moscow. It's very special. Uh, this is going to be maybe the best we've ever had. We're very proud of it. To Trump, the pageant mainly seems an opportunity to make contacts with Russian billionaires, the oligarchs. But the biggest trophy is Vladimir Putin. A Trump tweet before the start of the beauty contest. Do you think Vladimir Putin will come to Miss Universe? Do you think he'll be my new best friend? He actually said these things, you know? And that's when he started asking questions. Like, hmm, that's very interesting. He's becoming Russia's candidate. After the pageant, this is what Trump says about Putin. I was in Moscow recently, and I spoke indirectly and directly with President Putin. Three years later, when he is running for office, Trump again reaches out to the Kremlin. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. When Trump made that statement on July 27th, he knew Russian intelligence was working for him in his favor. Trump's call to Putin occurs a few days after the publication of thousands of Democratic Party documents by WikiLeaks. According to the American intelligence services, the documents were stolen by Russian hackers. 
16 agencies all came to the exact same conclusion that Donald Trump, the election hacking was done to make him president for Vladimir Putin. I don't think anybody knows it was Russia that broke into the DNC. She's saying Russia, 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 but I don't, maybe it was. I mean, it could be Russia, but it could also be China. It could also be lots of other people. It also could be somebody sitting on their bed that weighs 400 pounds, okay? Meanwhile, Congress has seven pending inquiries into the Russian interference in the elections. Still, Trump denies that the Kremlin has helped him become president. This is practically an act of war in the age of information. Why isn't he demanding answers? But he's not. He doesn't want to know. Why does Donald Trump insist that he has no involvement with the Russians? We also ask Pulitzer Prize winner Michael D'Antonio. He has interviewed Donald Trump many times and wrote a best-selling book about him. It's likely that there is Russian money that's uh, flowed into Trump uh, organization entities in one way or another, and that some of this money may have um, sources that are scandalous and would be uh, posing a big problem for a president. And if the Russians have that information, it could be what they're holding over Trump. I put it this way. If you're a gambling addict and you owe someone a lot of money, you will never insult your bookie, right? According to Nance and D'Antonio, Trump is likely to have had a weak spot as a businessman that the Russians would have taken advantage of. I've made over $8 billion. Donald Trump likes to present himself as a successful and extremely rich entrepreneur. Generally speaking, if I put my name on something, you know it's going to be good. And it sells. But as it turns out, Trump is not at all that successful. In the 1990s, his casinos and real estate businesses go downhill. We are on our way to see James Henry, lawyer and economic investigator, and an expert in the field of tax evasion. He has a history of six bankruptcies in the 1990s, so none of the major New York banks would lend to him. Trump was pretty much unfinanceable. Henry has dug deep into Donald Trump's business contacts. According to him, since his bankruptcies, Trump has become dependent on shady cash flows. The only way that he was able uh, to finance his resurrection after 2000 um, was the torrent of money flowing out of Russia and the former Soviet Union countries like Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan. The uh, investors that he got at that point were looking for safe havens uh, or opportunities to launder money that it proceeds from basically criminal enterprises. Trump himself denies having any financial connections with Russia. So I tweeted out that I have no dealings with Russia. I have no deals in Russia. I have no deals that could happen in Russia because we've stayed away. Uh, and I have no loans with Russia. The thing to notice when Donald Trump talks about his relationship with Russia is that he always says, I have no business in Russia. He doesn't say that Russians have no business with me. Indeed, Trump does do business with Russian partners outside Russia, as his own son, Donald Jr., said in 2008. Russians make up a pretty disproportionate cross-section of a lot of our assets. We see a lot of money pouring in from Russia. And I thought at that time, this is very strange. You know, I've not heard anyone else talk about how Russians are investing in their real estate. This is a much older relationship than the Russians have actually developed with Trump that may well, well go back to the 1980s. Really? Yeah, because Donald's first trip to Moscow uh, was <laughs> in July 1987. In the 1990s, under the Boris Yeltsin administration, Russia finds itself in a deep economic crisis. 
After the collapse of the Soviet Union, the state-owned businesses and the many mineral resources are sold for a song to a small group of corrupt insiders, the oligarchs. The rest of the people live in poverty. That's why there was such a demand for Putin at the end of this period. When Vladimir Putin takes office, Russia becomes an increasingly authoritarian state. Putin tightens the reins. From now on, he decides what happens to Russia's wealth. A lot of these very wealthy oligarchs began to put money abroad, financing um, people like Trump. And there was also an explosion of crime coming out of uh, uh, Russia, organized crime which it's pretty hard to disentangle the organized crime aspects of this story from the oligarchs because if you got to be a multi-billionaire, you didn't do that uh, in Russia without help from you know, some fairly tough people. I think it needs to be discovered exactly what these relationships are, why so many of these people would want to pour money into Trump properties. Who are Trump's financial backers? To find out, we visit this New York building. Trump Soho, 46 floors of luxury apartments. To get it off the ground, Donald Trump works together with another real estate company, Bayrock. I think in the case of Bayrock, we have a company um, that is led by people who have extremely shadowy backgrounds and profiles. Who are the people behind Bayrock? And where does the money come from that was used to build Trump Soho? In a minute, we'll show that Bayrock has connections with the Russian mafia. That one of the owners is allegedly involved in the prostitution of minors. And that Bayrock is setting up shady businesses in the Netherlands. U heeft twee bedrijven voor hen hier in Nederland uh, opgericht. Het is niet zo dat ik het dan zo herinner of dat het was dagelijks werk of dat soort dingen te doen. We discover that there is a lawsuit pending in New York against Bayrock. The company is accused of large scale tax fraud. We want to know more. We make an appointment with the man who is prosecuting the case against Bayrock for the state of New York fraud expert and lawyer, Fred Oberlander. Anybody running a business through a pattern of crime is guilty of racketeering. Anybody knowing what they're doing and helping him is guilty of racketeering conspiracy. They go to jail, and anybody injured by what they did can sue for triple damages. We delve into the history of Bayrock and end up with this businessman, Tefik Arif from Kazakhstan. Arif's family have made their fortune in the chromium industry. In 2001, he sets up Bayrock. He certainly was a figurehead for the company, okay? And from everything I know, he was the source of all of its seed capital. As it turns out, Tafik Arif is a hotel magnate. Confidential documents from Arif show that he uses complicated structures to run his hotels through companies in the Netherlands. You're dealing with people that seem to be involved in a worldwide network of shell companies, money moving around. In New York, Ari finds the perfect business partner, Donald Trump. Trump promoted himself as a larger-than-life real estate developer. so. We have this new player in real estate probably um, funneling money from Russian oligarchs into the American market, but needing a partner who was impressive and brought value of his own. Bayrock sets up business at the heart of Donald Trump's entrepreneurial empire, Trump Tower in New York. It seems a match made in heaven. Bayrock has the cash. Trump has the name. He even has his own television show, The Apprentice. In that show, we can see him put Trump Soho in the spotlight for the first time. Soho, here it is. 
The Trump International Hotel and Tower in Soho is the site of my latest development. This 50-story building will be the first condominium hotel in the city with world-class accommodations and panoramic views. Trump and Bayrock jointly own Trump Soho. Under American law, that means that Donald Trump is jointly responsible for all the business decisions made. Does Trump know who he's teaming up with? Internal Bayrock emails show that in addition to Arif, there is another owner, Felix Sater. Who is Felix Sater? He was born in Russia in 1966. Uh, came to Brooklyn in the 1970s with his father, who was uh, uh, named Mikhail Shefirovsky, changed his name to Sater, and was called by the FBI a uh, syndicate crime boss for Simeon Mogilevich's uh, uh, Moscow organized crime family. Felix Sater's father is a mafia boss who works for one of the most infamous Russian criminals, Semyon Mogilevich. According to an FBI director in a CNN interview, he has been in the top 10 of the most wanted list for years. Mogilevich is a, is a very high profile international organized crime figure. He's a man of a great deal of means. And we have every reason to believe that while he's based out of Russia at the moment, he could possibly be traveling uh, under false identification using aliases throughout the world. Mogilevich is considered responsible for numerous murders. This is him in a BBC interview 20 years ago. Did you have anything to do with his murder? This gentleman, yeah. Interestingly, over the past few years, at least three of Mogilevich's gang members lived at Trump Tower or bought apartments there. Some of the leaders of the gang are arrested and convicted. Felix's father is also arrested for extortion. He uses violence to force Brooklyn entrepreneurs to pay him. So that was Felix's father. In 1991, uh, Felix was convicted of stabbing somebody with a, a uh, margarita glass in a bar fight. After the stabbing, Felix Sater is arrested and put behind bars. He seems to be following in his father's criminal footsteps. And then he becomes involved in financial fraud, and he has a $40 million scheme in pumping penny stocks. Fraud and deception. Sater proves to be good at it. He works together with a group of mafia members, artificially driving up the value of shares by providing false information. The FBI traces him, but Sater flees to Russia. When he returns to New York, he still stands trial. But then, something strange happens. He is basically on the verge of pleading guilty uh, to those offenses, but he does a deal. Sater closes a deal. He becomes an FBI informant. He avoids punishment by turning on his accomplices. Supposedly, this has landed dozens of mafia members behind bars. And that's not all. Sater is also said to have helped American intelligence services. Some say that he went back to the former Soviet Union and at that point uh, provided some information about Stinger missiles that were being sold to the Afghan Taliban. In exchange for the information, Sater stays out of jail. In fact, the American government covers up the court transcripts about the fraud. Shortly thereafter, Sater reappears in the real estate company of Bayrock. In an interview with a Russian magazine, he says, I became a managing director of Bayrock. We had an office at Trump Tower, one floor below Trump's. As the court transcripts about Sater's fraud are sealed, he can simply move on to business as usual. Banks and investors in Bayrock do not find out anything about his criminal past. When you are running a business secretly controlled by Russian mafia, you got a whole lot of problems. Not a lot of banks are going to want to lend to a business run by the Russian mafia. So your number one objective is going to be cover it up. 
Oberlander says that by keeping Sater's past a secret, Bayrock is committing a felony. It isn't legal to run a business where you hide the fact that the biggest owner, or one of the biggest owners, is a convicted mobster. The maximum jail term would be 30 years. So you're in really serious trouble. We are in possession of internal Bayrock emails from 2007. They show that the company itself is indeed aware of Sater's crimes. For example, the legal counsel writes about the risk that Felix's past will be uncovered. Furthermore, he wants Sater's name removed from the documents. Felix Sater goes far to keep his secret. A Bayrock employee tells the lawyer Oberlander that he is being threatened by Sater. He said, how many times Sater threatened to kill me? He threatened to stab me in the throat. If I ever talked, he threatened people all over the place at Bayrock if they ever talked. Oberlander tells us that he himself is being threatened by one of Sater's associates as well. The threat said, if you don't drop the case now, but you'll regret it. An investor in a Bayrock project accuses the company of embezzlement. He swears that Sater has threatened to administer electrical shocks to his genitalia, to cut off his legs, and to leave his dead body in the trunk of his car. Of course, we are anxious to know how Felix Sater himself looks back on his past. We go to Port Washington, an hour's drive from New York. We have a couple of addresses where we might find Sater. I'm looking for Felix Sater. Do you know him? If anything would be, no, I don't know. If anything would be that way. That way? Yeah, One hundred nine. that way, yeah. Okay, thank All you. Right. Safe, one it's got to be down that way a little okay, bit. Okay, it has to be that side of the street then. On that side, right. Okay. Because that's the odd side. Okay, thank you. This is supposed to be one of Sater's business addresses, but the place looks closed. It's been a long time since the mailbox was last emptied. Back in New York, we do find an address for Bayrock. The company is no longer active, but is still registered to the former legal counsel a Mr. Julius Schwartz. Hi there, sir. Um, for Mr. Julius Schwartz. Okay, thank you. Schwartz? Schwartz, Julius Schwartz. I'm pretty sure he's not here. He has the people upstairs. Let me just call this girl. But Schwartz is not in, and no one is willing to talk to us. Meanwhile, Hearings are being conducted in Congress about the Russian interference in the presidential elections. The director of the FBI is making a statement. The congressmen want to know if he has information about Felix Sater. Director, are you aware of Felix Sater, a former Soviet official and advisor to the Trump Organization? I'm not going to comment on that. And director, outside of Mr. Sater's relationship with the Trump Organization, are you aware that the FBI knew of Mr. Sater because of a $40 million stock fraud case that was prosecuted by the federal government? Same answer. What did Donald Trump know about Felix Sater's crimes and his position at Bayrock? If Trump has kept Sater's criminal past a secret, he is an accessory to fraud and deception, says Oberlander. If I can show that Donald Trump at some point knew the truth about the crimes at Bayrock, or even some of them, and kept on helping Bayrock's businesses while knowing that it has been engaged and is continuing to engage in crime, that's it, goodbye, good luck. So if Trump knew about the shady background of his business partners, that could have huge consequences. What information did Trump have anyway? In 2007, the New York Times publishes an article on Sater and his crimes. So from then on, Donald Trump has to have been aware of them. And he said, I'm going to tell you this much. I guarantee you I'm going to get to the bottom of this really fast. Really fast. Trump promises to get to the bottom of the whole story of Sater and Bayrock. A meeting is called. 
we discover that the meeting is attended by the Bayrock management, as well as virtually the entire Trump family. They were all coming. Trump, Trump Jr., Eric, Ivanka, every lawyer on the back. They were all coming. But Donald Trump does not seem to intend to cut the ties to Bayrock. In fact, we can read that he uses the situation to demand more money for himself. Sater emails that Trump is happy with him. But in his external communications, Donald Trump acts as if he hardly knows anything of Sater's history, as becomes clear during a BBC interview. Why didn't you go to Felix Sater and say, you're connected with the mafia, you're fired? Well, first of all, we were not the developer there. That was a licensing deal. But your name was on it. A very simple licensing deal. Much but your about name's Felix. on it, Mr. Trump. Excuse me, but I don't know. You're telling me things that I don't even know about. He was connected with the mafia. Again, John, maybe you're thick, but when you have a signed contract, you can't, in this country, just break it. And by the way, John, I hate to do this, but I do have that big group of people waiting, so I have to Okay, leave. no, hold on. One last question, please, sir. I have to leave. Um, Thank you. A few months later, Trump is again confronted with Sater. He has to give a statement under oath in a lawsuit about a real estate project. About how many times have you have you conversed with Mr. Sater? Over the years? Over the years, if you could ask. Not me. many. Not many. If he were sitting in the room right now, I, I really wouldn't know what he looked like. Mm -hmm. This time, Trump says he wouldn't even recognize Sater if he bumped into him in the street. That's strange. Because after leaving Bayrock, Sater becomes one of Trump's advisors. He is given a business card from Trump's company, a telephone number, and an office close to that of Trump. It's an intriguing question. Why does Trump continue to do business with Sater and Bayrock? I think there's almost a thrill that he felt dealing with people who are willing to do things that others weren't willing to do, to act tough, to um, enjoy the suggestion that they're to be feared. Bayrock and Trump have ambitious $2 billion building plans. So they need investors. Investors who are willing to invest millions in the real estate projects. Who are these financiers? In a Bayrock presentation, we find this company, FL Group from Iceland. It turns out to be one of Bayrock's strategic partners. It turned out that FL Group uh, was at one point, 2006, the largest private equity investment firm uh, in Iceland, that it had a lot of connections to uh, the other big banks in Iceland. In the court transcripts, we can read that FL Group is backed by Russian investors that are said to be Vladimir Putin supporters. There was a number of allegations I heard that the FL Group was a major conduit for finance from Kazakhstan or from former Soviet Union. We do see FL Group making loans uh, to people connected to the Mogilevich Group. The records show that FL Group and Bayrock enter into an investment agreement. But we also read that there is a secret plan. FL and Bayrock are said to be planning a $250 million tax fraud together. All the partners have to approve the official agreement. Donald Trump also signs to indicate his approval. The truth is, it never would have closed if he didn't sign off on it. End of story. And I'm pretty certain that he knew that that was the case. Trump himself says he had no idea that this was a fraudulent transaction. I have concluded without any question that Donald Trump may be credibly charged with participating in a racketeering conspiracy based on what happened at Bayrock. Another strategic partner of Bayrock and Trump's comes up in the list of key investors. Alexander Moscovich, a Kazakh billionaire. Moscovich is a friend of Tafik Arif, managing director of Bayrock, another Kazakh. Moscovich is known to have been uh, running a lot of the chromium uh, uh, mining industry within Kazakhstan. 
And um, the Ari family was, of course, uh, then uh, running the processing of uh, chromium. We meet with Michael Byrd, a British investigative reporter. He has conducted an extensive investigation into Moscovich and Arif. In the uh, late 90s and the early 2000s, when the Ari family developed a lot of hotels and went into the US real estate market, certainly um, it seems that, the, that Mashkovich needed someone there on the ground in New York to uh, be the public face of a lot of the uh, developments that, that were happening there. And Tevfik uh, very much fitted that role. The oligarch Muscovich is one of the owners of the Eurasian Resources Group, a Kazakh mining multinational. He is also a leader of the Jewish community. Everything what I do, what everything I did, and I hope what I will do, I do this from my heart. Because because I believe what I do. This sounds good, but this Bayrock business partner, too, comes with a questionable reputation. Moscovich's company has been the subject of investigations into money laundering and corruption for years. In 2010, Moscovich and his friend Arif make negative headlines. Savoronadaki operasyonla ortaya çıkarılan fuhuş çetesinin liderinin Kazak asıllı milyarder iş adamı Tevfik Arif olduğu iddia edildi. Amerikalı ünlü iş adamı Donald Trump'ın da ortaklarında. It's June 28, 2010. A Turkish SWAT team enter a luxurious yacht in the port of Antalya. According to this Turkish police report, there are young Russian prostitutes on board that are said to be the victims of human trafficking. In the report, we find the names of Tevik Arif and Alexander Moskovich. Alexander Moskovich had asked his friend Tevik Arif to organize a party, and that party uh, involved uh, nine Russian models who were brought over to the yacht. Arif is supposedly using the sex party on the ship to close lucrative deals with foreign business partners. Turkish police were investigating a sex trafficking scandal because what had happened in the earlier that year, in 2010, is that um, people close to Tevfik Arif had brought in girls as young as 15 from Russia to Turkey to their hotels. So, Tevfik Arif is suspected of human trafficking of underage girls that are said to be prostituted at his hotels. Arif also rounds up the nine women on the ship. They are adults. The women refuse to give a statement. Alexander Moscovich, who had rented the yacht, manages to get out of the country. Certainly, it seems that he used his connections to, to get out of the country at that point. He didn't uh, face arrest, um, and neither did his colleagues. The only person who faced arrest was Tefik Arif. But Tefik Arif, founder of Bayrock, is acquitted. Only two of his associates are found guilty of human trafficking. How much money has Alexander Moscovich invested in Bayrock? We see he has all kinds of companies in the Netherlands. One of these companies, ERG, turns out to have a major branch in Amsterdam. We visit their office. Once inside, we are told that this is the financial heart of ERG, Moscovich's company. So, any payments to Bayrock may have been arranged through this office. Back in Washington, Congress is investigating Trump's Russian connections. One of the Democratic congressmen involved in the investigation is Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. There needs to be a proper balance, and that proper balance has been lost uh, in the route of corporate power that my book documents. We attend a speech given by White House on a new book that he has written. 
It's about the corrupting influence of large corporations on politics. What is the danger of having a president holding ties to Russian oligarchs, even maybe involved in deals concerning money laundering and tax evasion? The um, danger is that it plays into a well-established Russian toolbox of foreign influence. One of the ways in which the Russian government manipulates governments around it First, the old Soviet republics, and now Europe, your country, and in the last election, America, is to build a network of people whom they can control. And the traditional method is to find somebody who has uh, somewhat slippery business practices, an interest in politics or connections in politics, and to recruit them with basically bribery deals. Thank you so much. Do you think this ultimately will lead to his impeachment, Senator? There's a very significant chance of that. There's an awful lot of smoke around this investigation. Thank you. The senator thinks that Trump is likely to go down, partly because of his shady business deals. We seem to have stumbled on another questionable business partner of Trump's, yet another Kazakh. And again, there is a Dutch connection. It's this man, Viktor Krapunov, former mayor of Almaty, a city in Kazakhstan with over a million inhabitants. The Krapunovs were collecting money to stiffen into Swiss bank accounts and hide it there. They're now fugitives from justice. Krapunov is on the Interpol International Wanted List. He is wanted for stealing hundreds of millions from Kazakhstan. Krapunov is said to have laundered part of that money by buying three apartments at Trump Soho in 2013 from Bayrock and Trump. We're dealing with very clever international money laundering criminals. And it turns out there's more going on with Krapunov Bayrock and Trump. If we follow the money, we find out that as early as 2007, Kropanov set up a business in the Netherlands through frontmen. At the same time, Bayrock also sets up a mailbox company in Amsterdam, Bayrock BV. And then there was an overarching company, and that's where the money went. Krapunov and Bayrock also start a joint business in Amsterdam, Casbay BV, as we can see from the act of incorporation. It was designed to get millions of dollars out of New York into Europe through Casbay. Casbay was just a conduit. Emails show that the Dutch structure was set up by the law firm then owned by Rudy Giuliani. Giuliani is the former mayor of New York and has been one of Trump's confidants for years. Donald Trump is our only hope for change. We see that Bayrock and Kropanov use a Dutch intermediary, a trust office. That office sets up a so-called mailbox company. This way, the trust office makes sure that no one finds out who the real owners are. Four trillion euros are handled by Dutch mailbox companies every year. Many of them through the trust sector. Truskantoren zijn in Nederland aangesteld als poortwachter, poortwachter van een integere financiële sector. We visit DNB, the Dutch Central Bank. DNB has had great concerns about the Dutch trust office practices for several years, because more than 50% of those offices break the rules. Wij zien nog te vaak dat basale vereisten van uh, wie is mijn klant, waar komt het geld vandaan, wat is het doel van de structuur, hoe leg ik dat vast, wat zijn de transacties, zijn die ongebruikelijk, dat die basale processen onvoldoende op orde zijn. It's particularly Russians and Kazakhs who use Dutch mailbox companies and trust offices. They handle nearly 200 billion euros every year. Er staat nergens in de wet dat je zaken moet doen 
met uh, een, een politieke of een ex-politieke houten methode uit Rusland of uit wat voor hoog risicoland dan ook. Dat hoeft niet. The DNB considers Russia and Kazakhstan to be high-risk countries. An investigation by the bank shows that hundreds of politicians from those countries use Dutch trust offices, including politicians such as Viktor Kropenov, with very questionable reputations. Trustkantoren moeten weten met wie ze zaken doen. Dat mensen die willen witwassen, die uh, zijn betrokken bij terroristenfinanciering, waar fraude en belangentegenstellingen, uh, verstrengelingen spelen, dat die worden geweerd. Has the Dutch trust office that Kropenov and Bayrock used to cover up possible criminal activities? We visit the man who, through the trust office, used to act as director of Bayrock BV and Casbay BV. Dag, Sander Rietveld van Zemla. U heeft in 2007 twee bedrijven opgericht. Bayrock BV en Casbay BV. Nou, ik heb nou in 2007... Het is niet zo dat we dat gewoon... Zo herinnerd, want het was het werk op wat ze Ja, en zegt de naam Victor Krapunov u iets? Nee. Ik denk dat ik heel veel dingen. Ja. En het is nog niet tien jaar geleden. Ja. Wat ik zeker weet is dat PL, maar iedereen die de plans, en dat is ook een van de iedereen die de plans, dat is According to the man at the trust office, Bayrock was scrupulously screened. But what happened when, shortly after the foundation of these mailbox companies, it turned out that Krapanov was accused of embezzling money from Kazakhstan? And how did the trust office react when Felix Sater's mafia background came to light? Als u toen had gegoogeld, dan was u gestuurd op een artikel uit de New York Times waarin dit allemaal stond. Well, yeah, that is often that could be. The man at the trust office says that he was not to blame. In a reaction, Bayrock states that the Dutch companies had been set up for investment purposes. According to Bayrock, that investment was unsuccessful. There is another person who has allegedly worked intensively together with Krapanov, Felix Sater, the man with the close ties to the mafia and to Donald Trump. We have finally found his home address. What does Sater know about the Dutch money laundering structure? Hello, Mr. Sader. I'm a Dutch journalist um, and I'm doing a report on um, Bayrock. We came across some companies in the Netherlands. Okay, which companies in the Netherlands? Bayrock BV and Kasbai BV. Have you send me an email uh, to me and my attorney. Hold on, I'll give you the email address. Yes. And you can send me all your questions. Okay, I wait. My email, and this is my attorney's email. His name is Robert Wolf. So also my questions regarding money laundering and Krapunov. I could send, send them. your questions, you could send everything. Would it be meaningful to send that? Because could you answer any questions on money laundering or I Krapunov? I don't know about money laundering, but you could ask any question you want in writing. Yeah. And I'll CC my attorney, and we'll be more than happy to respond to any written questions. Okay, okay. Because most of the time, reporters twist your words anyway, so unless they're in writing. And Can I have a business card of yours? Yes, of course. Uh, it's in the car. Wait a second. So if you don't know anything about these Dutch companies, uh, we came uh, across the name of Julius Schwartz. He's uh, uh, the general counsel yeah. for Bayrock. Okay, and he founded these companies in the Netherlands. Send me your questions in writing. Yeah. I will answer them. Okay. Not in writing, I have no comment. Okay. Well, thank you anyway, and... Uh, It's a pleasure. I've been nice meeting you. Okay. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Next week, part two of Trump's controversial friends. Do you know this photograph of Mr. Trump and Lev Levayev? Lev Levayev is known as the King of Diamonds. We're talking billions of dollars. I'm looking for um, Mr. Levayev. He lives here. 
Get an exclusive preview in our new and improved newsletter. Go to our website and register.